see each of you here. We're so thankful that you are and for the privilege to worship our work together. Our text, will, <coughs> excuse me, our text will come from the uh, ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. If you'd want to uh, keep that in front of you, we'll be reading uh, uh, some of those verses uh, here in just a brief time. Would you pray with me? Father, the songwriter says, his mind reflects to the shadow of the cross before him, and we sing those words. I can't think of any better shadow than that because it somehow puts life and death and eternity in perspective. I thank you that uh, Mark, through what he uh, shared with us, has taken us into the vicinity of that cross where we would uh, encounter, as it were, look on once again the very dying form of the one who became sin for us. Father, now in these moments uh, you bring us uh, once again into an encounter with him not yet as he has uh, not yet as he would go to the cross, but nonetheless a, a life-changing encounter. So with uh, that shadow of the cross uh, looming before us, may we indeed hear our Lord and encounter him. Uh, maybe more correctly, may he encounter us in these moments. We pray in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Did uh, you see that uh, great game? Your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Psalm 90, 11. She really did prepare a great meal. How great <coughs> thou art. In his 67 years, he sure did uh, accumulate a great fortune. The ordinances of the Lord are sure. <coughs> In keeping them, there is great reward. Psalm 19, <coughs> verses 9 and 11. Did you, ever see, did you ever hear such a speech? It was great. Great is thy faithfulness. They said he just outran the secondary and made a really great catch. Your compassion is great, O Lord. Psalm 119, verse 156. It's one of those words that we use all the time, don't we? Great. We uh, hardly ever even think about it. It's a great day, it's a great job, it's a great movie, it's a great sandwich. But when you come right down to it, what is greatness? Our text for today has to do with just that, greatness. <coughs> Jesus had just fed 5,000 men plus women and children. Eight days after that feeding, after that miraculous feeding, uh, he had uh, gone up on the mountain with three of the 12 disciples, uh, and there in their scene, he was transfigured before them. <coughs> the next day, Jesus and those three disciples came down the mountain into the valley where they were met by a crowd of people. That's where our text takes up. 
Luke chapter 9, beginning with, excuse me, with verse 37. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. And a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth. And only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. <coughs> While he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. They were all amazed at the greatness of God. But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. For the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement. And it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. An argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child met him, and stood him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among you, this is the one who is great. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went into and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. The father was desperate. He had tried everything. Maybe this miracle worker could help. He arrived where he heard he was, uh, but he found that this miracle worker wasn't there. It was only his followers, his disciples. Maybe they could help him. This uh, spirit, this demon, was literally destroying his son, his only son. But no, the disciples were helpless in the face of this evil being. Is it any wonder that uh, the next day when this father saw Jesus approaching, he would literally shout his desperate plea, After first pointing out the reason for the disciples' impotency, <coughs> their un inability to uh, cast out the demon, to deal with this evil being, pointing out that the reason was their unbelief, their tiny amount, their lack of faith. Jesus calls for the boy and... Uh, in spite of the worst that the Spirit could do, he merely speaks a word of rebuke to the demon, and with simply a word, he heals the boy. 
and restores him to his father. The boy is completely healed, free of the demon, and it immediately became clear to all who were there that day that God was definitely at work through this miracle worker. Their only possible response was to marvel at how great God was. Luke says they were amazed at the greatness of God. As Jesus and his disciples began to walk away, uh, there broke out again. It, it wasn't the first time. It wasn't by any means the first time this had happened. Uh, but it was this discussion among the disciples once again. Uh, they were awed by God's greatness, but their thoughts all too soon turned to their own greatness. I don't know uh, just how uh, it maybe all got started. Maybe it was Bartholomew. Or maybe it was uh, the son of Alphaeus that said, uh, I wonder why uh, we couldn't cast that demon out. And, and then maybe it was Simon Peter that uh, spoke up and said, You guys, you just don't have it. If I had been here, instead of me being up on the mountain, if I had been here with you guys, I could have done it. And Bartholomew maybe responded, Oh, oh yeah, uh, who do you think you are? You think you're somebody special, somebody great? And so Luke says that however the conversation began, it developed into a full-scale argument into which Jesus immediately intervened. And essentially what Jesus said is, your concept of greatness is all messed up. Greatness is not about position, Jesus said. Greatness is not about attainment. It's, an, it's not about how forceful you are, how good you are at maneuvering and manipulating. That's not what greatness is all about. Jesus said greatness is about character. It's about the condition of your heart. He said, let me draw you a picture of uh, human greatness. And he takes a child and he stands him by his side. This child, he said, is not trying to climb the ladder of success. He's not trying to dominate others. You see, greatness is about welcoming it's about receiving. It's about uh, being changed by a relationship. Changed by a relationship with Jesus and with the Father who sent Him. That's what greatness is. It's all about receiving me and being changed and thereby receiving my Father and being changed. Essentially what Jesus was telling them that day is uh, men don't climb into. You don't ascend into greatness. Instead, you descend into greatness. But it was a lesson that was not learned and not internalized easily. Hardly had the words left Jesus' lips when uh, one of the twelve, John, pipes up and says, uh, Lord, speaking of greatness, uh, a little while ago uh, I saw somebody who wasn't one of us. And uh, he just hadn't quite attained our level. And he was trying to do the same work that uh, you want us to do, uh, uh, but, but we put a stop to that. Uh, after all, who does he think he is? 
And I can imagine Jesus somewhat discouraged, saying, John, John, try to understand, John. <coughs> Greatness is not about position. It's not about title. It's about receiving me. It's about following me. It's about serving like I serve, John. But still, uh, the disciples struggled to live out to gr true greatness. Jesus has begun his final journey to Jerusalem. He has the cross in view. Now it still weighs off, but nonetheless he has it in view. He travels uh, from Galilee in the north to Judea in the south. But as he often did, he uh, chooses to go through that center section of Samaria. It was the days before Best Westerns. It was the days before Super 8s. And there were not a lot of public uh, lodging places for visitors to town. Most often, uh, visitors would find accommodations in private homes, uh, uh, and, and hospitality was viewed as a, as a pillar of virtue in that society. So... Uh, that's where Jesus and the disciples would uh, need to find lodging. But, but the point is, uh, most of the villages in that day would uh, have been quite small. Not a lot of people living there. And uh, uh, to find hospitality, a place to stay in just a small village for 13 unexpected visitors, hey, that's a little bit of a tough deal. You need a little bit of advance uh, uh, warning. And so Jesus sends some of uh, the disciples in order to make advance preparations. Go in there and try and make arrangements so that all 13 of us have a place to stay tonight. You may be aware that uh, in the first century the Jews uh, had no particular love for Samaritans and after all this was a Samaritan village. And the truth is that the Samaritans returned the favor. They were only uh, antagonistic toward the Jews. So when uh, these messengers, Jesus' disciples, obviously Jews, entered the village and they inquired about uh, uh, some homes where they could stay the night. Uh, in the conversation with the villagers, uh, the conversation I imagine just naturally turned to, well, we can probably make arrangements to you. Where are you heading? Oh, we're headed for Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, Hospitality door slammed shut. These guys were obviously Jews. They're headed for the, the Jewish capital city of Jerusalem, and they want to stay here in our village? No way. You won't find any lodging here, not you pesky Jews on the way to your capital city. And so they simply said, you just as well go on. You won't find any place to stay in this village. It was a definite insult. A slap in the face, if you will, to Jesus and the disciples. When the brothers, James and John, heard of this, they said, You guys, uh, you don't have enough faith to cast a demon out of a boy. We'll show you what great faith looks like. Just give the word, Jesus, and we'll call fire down from heaven, and we'll just burn up those Samaritans and their whole village. We'll show them who's great. This time the Lord's rebuke was much more forceful. 
greatness was not to be found in some powerful demonstration of destruction. Greatness was to be found in genuine concern for the lives and souls of uh, uh, every single human being, even the lives and souls of their enemies. That greatness would soon be evidenced by the Son of Man. Could I suggest to you that uh, in this encounter with Jesus in our text, Jesus points up two misconceptions uh, about greatness, both of which are dangerously common in our world today, in our lives today. The first misconception is this, our faulty view of what constitutes greatness in life, particularly in uh, the lives of uh, the people around us, in our own lives. What's greatness all about in our lives? What indeed is the measure of greatness? Is political prominence the measure of greatness? Political accomplishment, a position of political power, is that greatness? The great politician, he knows how to sway votes. The great politician, he occupies the White House. The great politician gets re-elected to multiple terms. Uh, in the sports world, the great athlete is the one who amasses impressive numbers of yards gained. He's the one who uh, has that impressive earned run average. He's the one who uh, chalks up lots of races won. It's the one who's got uh, 15 years left in his multi-million dollar contract. That's the great athlete. Even in the religious realm, the great church is the church with the state-of-the-art facility, with the immaculate campus, building, and grounds. It's the, the great church is the one who has, which has hundreds, even thousands of people attending every Sunday. It's the one that has the weekly TV program. And the great minister, the great preacher, he's the one who's regularly asked to speak at conferences and conventions all over the country. But according to Jesus, God measures greatness not so much by attainment, certainly not by prominence or reputation, God measures greatness by means of a towel and a basin. In God's assessment, true greatness often goes unnoticed and unheralded. True greatness comes from long-term serving. It's the missionary who labors 37 years in that outpost region of Africa. He loves the people, and for all those years, really has very little visible evidence to show for what he's done. It's the wife who for 12 years bathes and changes the diaper of her invalid husband. In God's assessment, true greatness is the teenager who week after week goes to the nursing home and reads to a blind resident there from the Bible 
for an hour every Thursday after school. Contrary to what the world, to what <laughs> society, to what most people say, according to Jesus, no one climbs the ladder into great. You enter the realms of great by kneeling, by descending, by losing yourself. If that's the first misconception about greatness that we have in our world today, the second misconception is this. We, tr we tend to tr misunderstand what true human greatness is, but we also have an equal tendency to diminish God's greatness. It's more comfortable, it's less challenging to bring God down to our level. He's not as challenging, he's not as uncomfortable if he's that good old boy. If, if he just kind of winks at sin, especially my sin, uh, after all, his instructions are outmoded, they're old-fashioned, they're uh, for another less educated, less enlightened era. He would never allow a literal hell, uh, and he certainly never consign anyone to a place like that. But the reality is that God is great beyond our wildest imaginings. The psalmist says in uh, Psalm 145, verse 3, he says it this way, Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. He's so great that uh, out of absolutely nothing, he simply spoke and a universe sprang into being. He's so great that uh, he sustains that whole universe simply by speaking his words. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He thunders with his majestic voice. He unleashes his lightning beneath the whole heaven. Job 37 verses 3 and 4. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. Psalm 29 verse 10. His greatness is shown by casting evil spirits, demons out of possessed boys by merely a word as we saw in our text. And the unmis unmistakable certainty is that the greatness of God is evidenced in one climactic event. It's the event to which Lord Jesus points in our text today. Did you notice uh, those words uh, 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 it, as, as Jesus uh, said, uh, uh, while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink in to your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be, be, be delivered that could also be translated betrayed into the hands of men. Jesus said to the disciples, here's what true greatness is. True greatness is what I'm about to do in Jerusalem. Where God in the flesh, in the person of his son Jesus, would do the impossible. He would take the blackness, the repulsiveness, the filth, 
of human sin, of my sin, and of your sin. He would take all of that filth upon Himself and He would carry it to the cross. He would suffer horribly on that cross. He would die because the wages of sin is still death. It always has been and it always will be. Romans 6.23 God in the person of Jesus would pay the penalty. He would take the wages and in, his, and in apparent weakness he would die on that cross. I can imagine the devil snickering. I can imagine a party being thrown. We did it. We did it. We triumphed. He's dead. But no. Because God. Because God in the flesh, in the person of His Son Jesus, is great beyond our wildest imagination. Even death could not keep its hold on Him. And on the third day He arose, never to die again. He conquered the most uh, 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 foreboding enemy that has ever faced mankind. He conquered death. Because of His greatness. And in conquering death, He gives forgiveness, cleansing, eternal life, salvation to all who will put their faith and trust in Jesus and His atoning work on the cross. The psalmist says it real well. In Psalm 77, verse 13, Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among, your, among the peoples. You have by your power redeemed your people. The psalmist focuses on the greatness of God and His... As he looks at that greatness, he's carried to what God does to redeem, to buy back his people. That's what Christ did on the cross. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus and his atoning work on the cross? You do that by entrusting your life to Him in faith, by repenting of your sin, by confessing His name, by being buried with Him in the waters of baptism. If you've done that, then maybe, just maybe, what you need to do right now is look carefully and maybe reevaluate your own concept of what it means to be great. Of how you attain to true greatness. Maybe you need to decide that you're going to get off the ladder and get on your knees. But if you have never entrusted yourself to Jesus, the scripture says today is the day of salvation. It can be that for you. Our hymn decision is where he leads me, I will follow, number 373. If you need to uh, reevaluate your concept of greatness, if you need to uh, embrace the offer of salvation and forgiveness that is found in Jesus alone, maybe this decision time is just exactly for you to allow God to deal with you as He would. Would you stand number 373 where He